high-risk group, or these are the people with the Gleason 8 or higher prostate cancers. These prostate cancers are particularly dangerous, and they're dangerous because they have the potential to spread. So um, the reason why surgery is not universally curative for these people is because the cancer has a high probability of having spread before the surgery is actually done. So there is a small group of people who are identifying this cancer early and surgery cures them and then they're done. But then there is a, another group who have the cancer spread. And as a result, they have you know, cancer outside the prostate and obviously surgery for the prostate would not cure that. So with these Gleason 8 prostate cancer people, we usually say that if we expect you to live for more than five years, then we'd recommend treatment because uh, we can prostate cancer quite substantially. Les amis, alors euh, j'ai commencé par les cancers les plus graves et le mien était encore de loin plus grave puisque j'avais glycone 9, j'avais des métastases dans les os, dans les lymph nodes, dans un côté du poumon et que sais-je encore. Et cinq ans après les amis, je suis toujours là. Alors ne perdez pas espoir. Comme nous dit le docteur Adot à la fin de cette vidéo, il y a plein de nouvelles choses que l'on peut faire, en particulier ce que j'ai déjà fait par deux fois, le PSMA, où on voit les cellules du cancer bien à l'avance. Et donc, on peut réagir alors qu'avant, c'était très souvent trop tard, comme ça a été mon cas. Alors, Je vous laisse là aussi écouter ce docteur, ce docteur très en avance, comme il y en a peu. Many of us will hear the refrain that prostate cancer is something you often die with rather than from. But is this statement true? Today we'll look at the literature and find out whether the statement is actually in fact true or not. So let's jump into it. First, I just want to say I'm happy to see how much we've been able to help all of you with these videos. I'm excited to see the channel grow and you guys sharing these videos with others is what's leading to this getting to more people and ultimately helping people get high quality information so they can make good decisions about their care. Now let's take a look at the data. So there have essentially been two large studies that look at active monitoring versus surgery for prostate cancer. So when they say active monitoring, what they did is they essentially uh, took people who were diagnosed with prostate cancer and gave them no treatment at all unless the cancer became symptomatic, meaning they had pain from like metastasis or there was known metastasis. So essentially, it's a non-treatment strategy until the cancer got very bad and was no longer curable versus surgery. And these studies were done mostly in the early 90s, late 80s and have been followed for many years. And you can see there's two studies that are up right now. Uh, the one on the left is called the uh, Scandinavian Prostate Cancer Research Group. Uh, so it's a randomized clinical trial with almost 30 years of follow-up. And the one on the right was commonly referred to as PIVOT. And this is a study, again, of looking at prostatectomy versus observation. And so let's look at the data for these. First thing we need to do before we look at the data is see how they divided patients. So they divided patients into three groups. Those who had low risk disease, intermediate risk disease, and high risk disease. And they defined low risk disease as people with Gleason 6 prostate cancer. So Basically, anyone with Gleason 6 prostate cancer became low risk as long as their PSA was not very high. Intermediate risk was the people with a Gleason score of 7 with um, a PSA of less than 20. By today's standards, it's actually a very high cutoff. And then the high risk people were the people with a Gleason score of 8 or higher. If you don't know what a Gleason score is, you can look at my video about what are Gleason scores and what are grade groups because that might help you. Um, like Gleason 8, for example, is a grade group 4. You'll know from your prostate biopsy where you are in terms of your Gleason score. And so the data from these studies have, has been published numerous times, but the data from these studies uh, was summarized by a colleague of mine, Dr. Timothy Daskovich, in this paper. And so this is where I'm going to draw the, the data you're going to see from. So in this data, what they did is they summarized the outcomes of these two studies, the SPCG group and the PIVOT study group. What you see is that for patients with uh, low-risk prostate cancer, the rates of mortality were actually relatively low. So let's take a look at this. Let's kind of zoom in. And let's start by looking at the 10-year time point. And we see that at 10 years out in the Scandinavian group study, at 10 years, 4% of people who had surgery died. And 5% of those who had watchful waiting died. This means that there was only a 1% improvement in survival from surgery. So in this low-risk group, this didn't make a big difference at 10 years out. Same with the PIVOT study, which was based in the United States. At eight years, they saw a 1% difference, a one between 
the Watchful Waiting and the Prostatectomy group. This is crazy. This is really, really, really impressive. And this is why we don't usually recommend surgery for grade group one or Gleason six prostate cancer. The low risk prostate cancers have a very low risk of causing death within the first 10 years. And because of that, we often watch people repeat biopsies and make sure their cancer doesn't evolve into something more dangerous. And therefore we can only intervene if their cancer evolves into something more dangerous. Because as you can see, for a 10 year follow-up, the risk of dying is very low. Now, if we go forward to 18 years, because these studies had 18-year follow-up and 16-year follow-up, respectively, we see that the difference in survival rates were between 1% to 4% improvements in cancer-specific survival, meaning death due to prostate cancer, was only improved by 1% to 4% with surgery. And we know that surgery has downsides, so a 1% to 4% gain is really not that substantial. And that's why we, again, say Gleason 6 prostate cancer, we often do not recommend treatment. But let's look at the next risk group. The next group is this intermediate risk group. And we're going to, let's, let's zoom in on this section. So here we can see that things start to become a little bit different. At 10 years out, the difference in those who had watchful waiting in terms of their dying, the risk of dying from prostate cancer was much higher in those who had watchful waiting versus those who had prostatectomy, especially in the SPCG group, which was done in Scan the Scandinavian group. And here you can see that there was a, about a 10% or 11% reduction in the likelihood of dying from prostate cancer if you underwent surgery. So total risk of 7% versus 18%. In the US cohort, the difference was only 2% at eight years out, which is not too dramatic. But if we look out to the longest time points, which are 18 years and 16 years, which were reported, you start to see that these deviate a lot. That the risk of dying from prostate cancer if you had prostate cancer surgery was actually about one half or less than the risk of those people who did nothing or did not treat their cancer. So I wanna summarize this for you. And so you should see that at 16 and 18 years out, those people who had treatment for their prostate cancer actually, uh, who had intermediate risk disease, actually got a substantial benefit, had much lower risk of dying from the prostate cancer. But the people with the very low risk disease, AKA the Gleason 6, that we usually don't recommend treatment for, they had a very negligible improvement. There was still a risk of dying from prostate cancer, even with grade group one prostate cancer. but. To be honest, as we do more analysis, we find that most of those people who are classified as grade group one were actually grade group two or Gleason seven prostate cancer. And as a result, they were just inaccurately identified or inaccurate, inaccurately classified with Gleason six prostate cancer or grade group one prostate cancer, when in reality they had something more dangerous like Gleason seven or grade group two or higher. And this, the biopsy just happened to miss it. Um, this is a good point to just throw in that if you have not watched the video about MRI targeted biopsy, uh, that's a good one to watch because the way we do biopsies have evolved substantially since the period where these studies were initiated. And nowadays our likelihood of miscategorizing someone's risk of prostate cancer is actually uh, very different. It's actually much lower. So that's a very good thing. Now, I bet that what you're wondering is, well, what about, you know, the high risk people? Like, who are these people who died in these cohorts? Can we get any information to try and figure out who died in these cohorts? Doc, you haven't even talked about the people who are in the high risk group. And we actually have data on that. So we're gonna look at that now. I'll first start by saying there weren't enough patients in these studies to look at high risk groups and create graphs and tables like I showed you previously. Rather, what they did is they looked at the people who are high risk and said, what was the likelihood of these people dying from prostate cancer relative to the people with grade group one prostate cancer, the low risk group? So let's look at that data. So the first thing we want to look at is the risk of dying from prostate cancer. Here this arrow shows you where to find this data. And the first thing they look at is margin status, whether the surgery had a positive margin or a negative margin. A positive margin means that the surgeon cut at the edge of the cancer. And so we assume that there's cancer on the other side of the edge left in the patient. We find that that didn't have a huge impact on someone's likelihood of dying from prostate cancer. It was elevated, it was about 2.5 times higher, but it wasn't the biggest factor. When in fact were the biggest factors were extracapsular extension. This is when the cancer grows outside of the capsule of the prostate. So the prostate has a, um, has a, a skin over it, kind of like a skin of a tomato. You can think of it as a capsule over it. And when we do our surgeries, we try not to, um, well, we try to get all the cancer out. We usually follow this capsule unless we know the cancer has grown out of the capsule. But uh, if the cancer has grown out of the capsule, uh, the likelihood of that cancer being dangerous is higher. And we find that the people who had cancer grow out of the capsule had about a seven and a half times increase in risk of dying of prostate cancer. 
The second, second group who had significantly higher likelihood of dying from prostate cancer were those with the Gleason 8 or higher prostate cancer. So Gleason 8 or higher prostate cancer are the highest risk prostate cancer groups. And what we found for these groups is that their risk of dying for prostate cancer was 20 times higher than the other groups, specifically 20 times higher than the grade group 1 prostate cancer people. This means Gleason score is the biggest risk factor in someone's risk for prostate cancer. So I want you to sort of take all this data together and start to form a synthesis of the information. And this is where I come in to be helpful because this is what I do every day. So I want to help you package this data in a way that is easy to summarize and something that you can uh, sort of take, take to the bank. And so the big picture is for the low-risk prostate cancer patients, these are the patients with Gleason 6, also known as grade group 1 prostate cancer, your likelihood of dying from that prostate cancer in the next 10 years with no treatment is likely very low, probably below 5%. The only chance where you would have significant risk from that prostate cancer is if your biopsy missed an area of worse cancer that was there. So for people like that, we often recommend a repeat biopsy at some point down the line to be sure that you have not miscategorized a grade group 1 cancer when in reality something worse is present. The second thing is to look at the intermediate risk people, and these are the people with grade group 2 disease. Here we see that the risk of dying from prostate cancer is actually not astronomically high, and you have to consider how long you're going to live. If you're someone who's going to live, let's say, for five years, we're going to go back to the data. Let's say your life expectancy is for five years and you were diagnosed with grade group 2 or Gleason 7 prostate cancer. We can see from the data looking at the five-year uh, time points that there is almost no difference in outcomes between those people who had surgery and those people who did not. So if you have grade group 2 prostate cancer and you have all kinds of medical comorbidities and your doctor says, hey, I expect your life expectancy to be five years more, it's probably not worth it for you to undergo surgery. But once you get the 10 years out, we start to see a big distinction between the survival of those people who had surgery and those who did not. And as a result, I'd probably recommend a treatment of some kind, whether it's surgery or radiation, for someone with Gleason 7 or grade group 2 prostate cancer if uh, they have 10 years or more to live. And you really see for those people who live to live to be 20 years uh, be after the diagnosis, there's a real huge distinction between treatment and non-treatment in terms of outcomes. Now, finally, we should talk again about the high-risk group, or these are the people with the great Gleason 8 or higher prostate cancers. These prostate cancers are particularly dangerous, and they're dangerous because they have the potential to spread. So um, the reason why surgery is not universally curative for these people is because the cancer has a high probability of having spread before the surgery is actually done. So there is a small group of people who are identifying this cancer early and surgery cures them and then they're done. But then there is a, another group who have the cancer spread. And as a result, they have you know, cancer outside the prostate and obviously surgery for the prostate would not cure that. So with these Gleason 8 prostate cancer people, we usually say that if we expect you to live for more than five years, then we'd recommend treatment because uh, we can reduce your likelihood of dying from prostate cancer quite substantially. I hope that this has all been very helpful. And I also want to just couch this data within the context of the evolution of the field. So this data is mostly based on practices from the 90s uh, that carried over to the uh, early 2000s. And as a result, it reflects some of our older practices. Um, it was at a time when people were not largely doing robotic surgery routinely. It was at a time when uh, we did not have MRI to help diagnose and identify areas of prostate cancer. And it was a time when we did not have PSMA PET scans to help identify if cancer had spread. So I would say looking at this, it's very likely that the outcomes uh, in terms of survival with treatment are going to be substantially better than those reported in the literature here. So I hope that this gives you some reassurance and helps you know when it's right to get treatment for your prostate cancer and when it's not. So again, in one line, Gleason 6, probably don't need to get treatment, but you should get a biopsy again to make sure the diagnosis is right. Gleason 7, probably a good idea to get treatment, especially if you're expected to live 10 years or longer. Gleason 8 or higher, treatment is usually a very good idea because this can be a quite dangerous cancer and you probably do not want to delay. All right, guys, it was great to see you. Um, I am very happy to see that this channel is reaching so many people and helping so many of you. The comments very clearly show that this has been valuable. Um, if you can do me a favor and like and subscribe and share this with others, I greatly appreciate it. For those of you who have made contributions to cancerbetter.com or on this YouTube channel, it's very kind of you. Thank you. I use them directly to pay for costs just for filming and editing. So thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.